Thank you for coming today. My name is Bob Hummer. I'm at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. President Amy Choi has asked, uh, asked me to serve as presider of today's ceremony. It's been a joy to work on the program with her over the past year, and I was honored to be asked to, be, to serve in this capacity. Thank you all for coming to this uh, presidential address and award ceremony, and thank you in general for coming to the PAA. I hope it's been a great meeting for everyone so far. Um, I want to especially welcome our, uh, those of you who've, who have come from abroad today. Um, it's not the easiest time or context to travel to the United States, and I'm especially thankful for those of you who came from abroad to the PA. It's much, much appreciated. Before we get on with the business of uh, this session, uh, I wanted to mention two small housekeeping things. First, um, we have a captioner uh, up in the front right. If anyone needs a captioner, um, please feel free to come up to the front right for that. Um, and second, if you would please silence your cell phones uh, during the ceremony, that would be much appreciated. Let's begin today's ceremony um, with uh, uh, with the announcement of the Government and Public Affairs Committee Service Award recipients, and to do so, I welcome Mary Jo Hoxima to the podium. Hello, everyone. It's my pleasure to announce the recipients of the Excellence in Public Service Award. This award was created in 2008 to honor federal, state, and local policymakers who have supported population research and the federal agencies that fund it. This year, the Selection Committee chose four worthy recipients, two members of the United States Senate and two congressional staff members. Senator Roy Blunt, a Republican from Missouri, and his colleague, Senator Patty Murray from Washington State, were chosen in recognition of their bipartisan leadership on the Senate Appropriations Subcommittee that funds the National Institutes of Health. Together, Senators Blunt and Murray have led successful efforts to increase NIH funding by $2 billion in fiscal year 2016 and are trying to do so again for fiscal year 2017. In the congressional staff category, the selection committee chose one Democratic staffer from the U.S. House of Representatives and one Republican staffer from the U.S. Senate. Robert Bonner, the Democratic clerk for the subcommittee that funds the Census Bureau and the National Science Foundation, was chosen for his efforts not only to fund these agencies, but also for his tireless work behind the scenes to protect and support the American Community Survey. And lastly, Laura Friedel, the majority clerk for the Senate subcommittee that funds the National Institutes of Health, was chosen for her work promoting demographic research programs at NIH, protecting the NIH peer review process, and enabling the NIH to continue to support health economics research. All of these individuals received their awards last month when PAA held its advocacy days in Washington, D.C., but I will be sure to let them know how well received um, their, the news was at today's session. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Mary Jo. Um, next, to present the Dorothy S. Thomas Award, I welcome Jeffrey Passell to the podium. Thank you very much, and good afternoon. Uh, Dorothy Swain Thomas was one of the pioneers of our discipline. She received her PhD in 1924, and over the next 50 years, taught at the University of California at Berkeley, Columbia, and the University of Pennsylvania, where she helped found and direct the Population Studies Center. She wrote a number of books and dozens of pathbreaking scholarly articles. Her distinguished research, teaching, and academic career included many firsts. She was the first female professor at the Wharton School and president of the American Sociological Association. 
Closer to home, she was the first woman elected to the PAA board in 1937, and she served as president of our association in 1958-59. The Dorothy S. Thomas Award in her honor is presented annually to the best graduate student paper on the interrelationships among social, economic, and demographic variables. I want to thank the hardworking committee uh, that worked on this, Coulter Mitchell of the University of Pennsylvania, Catherine Yount of Emory, Jason Fletcher of the University of Wisconsin-Madison, Leah Van Wy at Brown, Amar Hamoudi from Duke, and Rob Warren at the University of Minnesota. We received 17 submissions uh, several of which had already been published in academic journals. So based on our review, I think it's safe to say the future of the discipline is in good hands, as there were a number of papers worthy of the award. Uh, the award. But we were able to reach a clear consensus. This year's winner, Move to Opportunity, is a careful and important analysis that exploits public housing demolition here in Chicago as a natural experiment on the long-run effects of moving out of a disadvantaged neighborhood. Displaced children have notably better labor market outcomes than their peers who remained in place. The work helps to resolve a discrepancy in the study of neighborhood effects and will have important policy consequences as it implies that the benefits of relocating children may be larger than suggested by previous housing experiments. The work is part of the author's dissertation at the University of Michigan. He is now assistant professor at the University of Virginia. I'm very pleased to present this year's Dorothy Thomas Award to Eric Chin. Thank you, Jeffrey, and congratulations, Eric. Um, the next award to be presented is the Irene B. Tarbier Award. Uh, to do so, I welcome to the podium one of our former presidents, Douglas Massey. Irene Tarbier was president of the Population Association of America and vice president of the IUSSP and was the first woman elected to both positions. Her scholarly production includes 16 books and monographs and some 250 articles. For more than 20 years, she also prepared the annotated bibliographies for the Population Index. She did much to bring comparative, a comparative perspective to the discipline of demography, and her research covered more than a dozen countries in Asia, Africa, Latin America, North America, and Oceania including a celebrated book on the population of Japan. The award, named in her honor, presented every two years in recognition of an unusually or important contribution to the scientific study of population or for an accumulated record of exceptionally sound and innovative research. This year's recipient has accumulated a distinguished record of research and service, seeking to improve the empirical foundations for understanding population processes and policies through the systematic analysis of high quality data and using the techniques and using techniques that limit the confounding effects of, of unobserved uh, factors and behaviors. The recipient's contributions cross the disciplinary lines of demography economics, sociology, nutrition, health, public policy, and education. And by improving the scientific, social scientific evidence base for population analysis policies, these contributions have had an important effect in a number of different areas of understanding and policy formation. Selected examples of the awardee's research include pioneering identical twins, fixed effect estimates to investigate schooling impacts on earnings, health, mortality, hospitalization, occupation, and investments in the next generation, pioneering use of identical twin studies to investigate relations between birth weight and life cycle and intergenerational outcomes without the confounding effects of uh, maternal health, family background, and genetics, thus illuminating birth weight's true impacts leading an investigation into the life cycle impacts of early life nutrition, adult uh, outcomes decades later to estimate rates of return to policies seeking to alleviate malnutrition. 
the development and estimation of new models of intrafamilial allocations and investments in children that identify whether parental preferences are compensating or reinforcing, and uh, helping to pioneer studies of HIV AIDS in Sub-Saharan Africa that advance knowledge that may, that, uh, of the roles that social networks and the understanding of risk play in shaping behaviors of both the afflicted and the healthy. This body of work has been presented to the public, policymakers, and scholars through more than 400 refereed articles, 35 books that have together garnered 29,000 citations in Google Scholar. These contributions have demonstrated the relatively high returns to investments in human capital formation relative to other policy options, showing us the way to maximize the quality of lives and enhance the mobility prospects of both individuals and nations. It's thus my great pleasure to present the 2017 Irene B. Teuber Award to Jerry R. Behrman, the W. R. Kennan Professor of Economics, Sociology, and Demography at the University of Pennsylvania. Thank you, Doug, and congratulations, Jerry. Next on the agenda is the Harriet B. Presser Award. To present this award, I welcome Paula England to the podium. Harriet Presser was with us so recently um, that I feel I don't need to say so much about her work. Um, so many of us knew her and, and read her work and talked with her about her work so recently. Um, but her work centered really on bringing a gender perspective to demography. And um, because of this, the Harriet B. Presser Award has been given biennially, biennially since uh, 2009 to honor scholars who've made sustained contributions to the study of gender and demography. This year's committee chair was Deborah DeGraff, who couldn't be here this afternoon. So um, I leapt at the opportunity uh, to give the award. Uh, the other members of the committee were Karen Brewster, Alice Cackley, Phil Cohen, Gary Gates, Linda George, and me. This year's winner is, roughly speaking, from the same generation as Harriet Presser. Undoubtedly, she uh, knew Harriet and had lots of discussions with her. She earned a Penn PhD and holds an honorary doctorate from the University of Stockholm. She's the author of over 100 articles and numerous books, and I won't detail the many awards she's won. Some of her work brings a gender lens to the study of the second demographic transition, featuring the retreat from marriage, low fertility, increases in cohabitation, non-marital births, and divorce. Our winner has investigated whether the gender revolution pushes us towards, to use her words, new families or no families. <clears throat> Regarding women's employment, the leading edge of the gender revolution, she observes that at first it destabilized or discouraged marriage, but in some settings that effect has disappeared or reversed. She's drawn our attention to what she calls the second half of the gender revolution, the participation by men in childcare and housework. This half of the gender revolution has advanced less than the first half. Women's employment, notably less, right? Um, <clears throat> but in some societies and groups, men's family work has increased substantially. An insightful 2015 article in PDR, of which she's the co-author, identifies mechanisms through which men's domestic participation stabilizes couples' relationships and encourages second births. In this way, she believes, the gender revolution can actually be family-friendly. Today's winner has illuminated these and other topics in her career involving faculty positions at Skidmore, Brown and the University of Maryland. I'm delighted to give the 2017 Harriet B. Presser Award to Francis Goldscheider.
think most people refuse, but I was given the opportunity to sit, talk for one and a half to two minutes, and I decided I would take it. Um, first, I need to think, thank my mentors, none of whom are around anymore, but one of whom was Dorothy Swain Thomas, my colleagues and co-authors, one of whom was Harriet Presser, my students who often became co-authors, and of course the prize committee who looked beyond the gender studies of our lives, which has focused on women, work, and family, to see what I call the fourth cell. And I want to take a minute to talk about a two-by-two -two table that really structures and informs my work. And I think we can hold that much in our heads. We're demographers, male, female, work, family. I grew up in the 1950s in a diagonal world. Men, work, women, family, but came into research amidst a new view, what I see as the third cell, as women and wives and mothers went out to work, taking on a second shift. Much research, even many journals. But the fourth cell remained largely invisible, with men's domestic work dismissed, as women's employment was earlier on. But the fourth cell, which is really men and work and family, is where I've spent the last part of my career. As a field, it is still inchoate, split between studies of housework, which is what demographers and economists and sociologists do who often ignore childcare and see reverses and stalls, and the fatherhood literature, which is primarily psychological, but they see growth, it's a little touchy-feely for us, but it's an important part of what's been going on. And it's a field that needs so much more research, my fourth cell, especially on trends, determinants, consequences. But as Paula pointed out, we already know some consequences that when men start getting more involved in their families, it is good for the family. And I hope that all of you, in your own research, in your teaching of new researchers, and even in your own lives, carry on filling in our understanding of the fourth cell. Okay, congratulations, Fran. Thank you, Paula. Finally, to present the Robert J. Lapham Award, I welcome Mary Beth Ofstedal to the podium. Thank you, Bob. The Robert J. Lapham Award is given biennially in recognition of contributions that blend research with the application of demographic knowledge to policy issues. Refle reflecting Bob Lapham's influential and far-reaching career, the award, which is sponsored by PAA, emphasizes service to the profession and contributions that enable others to conduct research, along with works of original research. I'd like to thank my fellow committee members, Wendy Baldwin, who's retired from the NIH, Sarah Curran at the University of Washington, Joan Kahn, the University of Maryland, Mark Montgomery, the Population Council, Kelly Music at Cornell University, and Judy Trees at the University of California, Irvine. We received a lot of very strong nominations this round. Uh, that made our work much more difficult, but it was both inspiring and humbling to read uh, through the outstanding careers and credentials of all of the nominees. The recipient of the 2017 Lapham Award began his career as a statistician at the National Census Bureau in Senegal before completing his graduate studies at the University of Pennsylvania in the mid-1980s. He has worked at the Sahel Institute's Socioeconomic and Demographic Unit, spent 14 years at the Rockefeller Foundation, where he retired as a vice president in 2006, and in the time since then, he has worked 
uh, as a senior advisor to the Hewlett Foundation and as an adjunct professor at the University of Laval in Canada. Although a lifelong resident of Africa, his career has been an inspiration to international donors, program officers, and demographic researchers, not only in Africa, but also in Europe and North America. While at the Rockefeller Foundation, he was instrumental in the development of numerous population programs and initiatives in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, just a couple of which include the establishment of the African Population and Health Research Center in Nairobi, and the Higher Institute of in, uh, Population Studies, or IPPS, at the University of Ouagadougou. The projects and institutions that he developed have linked demographic researchers across continents into lasting partnerships and collaborations. Through his own mentorship and the program, training programs he developed, he has influenced countless students who have gone on to pursue careers that have further expanded both institutional and individual capacity. In short, through his crucial groundwork and capacity building, he helped put African demography on the map. On behalf of PAA and the Awards Committee, I'm very pleased to present the 2017 Robert J. Lapham Award to Dr. Sheikh Mbake. <laughs> Unfortunately, <laughs> Unfortunately, Dr. Mbake is unable to attend PAA this year, uh, so he asked Dr. Ayaga Bawa from the University of Ghana to accept the award on his behalf. Thank you. Good evening to you all. Um, I'm pleased to receive the award on behalf of Dr. Sheikh Mbaki. Sheikh would have loved to be here to receive the award personally. Unfortunately, due to scheduling problems, he's not here to receive, but I'm pleased to receive the award on his behalf. Sheikh would want to thank the PAA and the numerous friends and colleagues who have made this award possible. Thank you all. Congratulations to all our award winners this year. Uh, what a fantastic group. Um, now to introduce our president, I welcome Amy Choi's son, Andrew, to the podium. Andrew. Good evening. Um, <clears throat> My name is Andrew Choi, and I have the, uh, the privilege today to introduce to you all this year's 2017 PAA president, Dr. Amy Ong Choi. So in, in the interest of full disclosure, as I guess somebody spoiled already, I should tell you that Dr. Choi is my mother. And um, using the vast powers of her presidency, uh, she appointed me, her son, <laughs> to fill this role. So um, a little unorthodox, maybe, a little break from convention, maybe. Uh, well, you say what you will about nepotism, but um, <laughs> I think it's safe to say we're, we're doing things a little differently these days. <laughs> um, so jokes aside, uh, when my mother asked me to introduce her this year, I, I, I don't think I knew what I was getting into. Uh, when mother asks for these things, you just, you oblige. Um, and so for, for those of you who know her, you'll know that my mother is what I, I like to describe as a, a tireless bundle of brilliance captured in a little package of soft-spoken, smiley modesty. Um, she doesn't like undue attention. She doesn't, uh, she, she shuns the spotlight and I know her so well that I can confidently tell you that right now um, she wants me to quit yapping and make way for the rest of today's programming. But I've never been an especially obedient son and I don't intend to start now. Um, so my mother actually doesn't know what I'm about to say because she didn't, she didn't help me with this. I had to bug her for her CV 
and I had to do my own research. And I'll tell you, the, the exercise of reviewing your mother's CV as an adult is a weird and surreal experience. <laughs> and that's, that's especially true when it's 26 pages long and it covers nearly four decades of her career. So at a high level, here's what I learned, or perhaps relearned. Um, my mother received her bachelor's and master's degrees from the University of Hawaii at Manoa, and her PhD in sociology from the University of Chicago. So this is, this is actually somewhat of a homecoming for her. Um, she spent around 20 years as a professor at the University of North Carolina, um, and thereafter moved to the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health in 2002, where she was the director of the Bill and Melinda Gates Institute for Population and Reproductive Health until 2013. She is currently a senior scholar there still. And for those of you who are interested in, in more detail and perhaps more accuracy, her CV is available at her faculty website. And I think that her uh, you know, v record of voluminous publications and, and accolades, they speak for themselves. And I won't get into that here. But for me, reviewing her CV was actually a much more emotional exercise. Um, first, I felt regret. I, I, I felt a little sad about how much of my mother's early professional life went entirely unnoticed by her family, which is, you know, was composed of two wild, wild little boys. And my father, who, who approximates a wild little boy, albeit a little older, um, <laughs> Then, then, then I felt, felt like a, a twinge of nostalgia, sort of seeing again in print the names of, of so many people who were really integral to my childhood. Um, and, and I should mention, I, I recognize a lot of you here today. And, and of course, I felt a, a, a very special sense of, of utter and, and, and complete inadequacy um, as a member of the voting public. So. Um, but I think what I took away from this overall exercise was, was more important, and, and it was something that I hadn't thought of before. Um, I think I realize exactly now why it is that our, our family never, never really fit in anywhere. We were always just kind of weird and freaky, and it's because of my mother. <laughs> so the fact is, um, many of us have impressive mothers, and many of us have even have had impressive mothers who were also impressive professors. Uh, but my brother and I had an impressive mother who was an impressive professor in the field of reproductive health. And, and I think that's unique. So, so if you'll indulge me, I'll tell you a little bit about what that's like. Um, it goes something like this. You're in the sixth grade. Your friends come over to play Nintendo. Your mother brings over popcorn, soda, and condoms. Um, <laughs> It goes something like this. You're, you're in high school, your mother is hosting her faculty colleagues over for dinner and conversations by the grill concern venereal diseases, <laughs> fistulas, comparative contraception use in Uganda and Egypt. Or it goes something like this. You're, you're eating dinner with your family at a fancy restaurant and in between sips of your soup, your mother politely asks you and with a straight face, if you would ever consider cryogenically freezing your own sperm. <laughs> and then, without skipping a beat, she whips out the article that she printed out for you that details the process of how, that, how you get that sperm into a cup. So, so this can be grim, okay? It can be grim and it can be confusing and awkward when you realize that, that other families don't have the same kind of dinnertime conversations that, that you do. But it can be wonderful, too, um, because I think that for someone who is so willing to take her work home with her and to make that work so much a part of uh, her family's lived experience, the, co the, the conventional lines drawn between pupil and teacher and parent and child are easily blurred. And um, everything, and I mean everything, can become academic. Uh, <laughs> And so I think I, I speak for my brother and my father and my wife. Um, we're grateful for that. Uh, we love being that weird family that doesn't fit in anywhere, uh, and we love her very much. So with that, it gives me the greatest pleasure to welcome to the stage my teacher, my mother, and my hero, Dr. Choi. So, 
So I don't think I need to give a presidential address after that. <laughs> Andrew, you did, you did exactly what I thought you would do. Thank you. <laughs> after this, it's going to be very dull. Uh, so I, I really want to thank Bob Hummer. I congratulate all the honorees today, including the ones who were on, on the Honor a Colleague Award. The PAA is such a wonderful meeting. Um, I've been coming here uh, regularly every year for at least 40 years. So I thought, as usual, oh, by the way, this is a Miley Lay. We have to do things different. So the Smiley Lay was given to me by a former PA president, Dr. Karen Mason, who lives in Honolulu. And it is a special lay to honor occasions. So I wanted to also say, I think we could start um, with the PowerPoint and go to this slide. Yes, so one of my um, professional habits that persisted until last year was to reference and transform the saying, success has many fathers, to success has many mothers. And I appreciate the comments of Fran Goldscheider on this. I think maybe the fourth cell might be coming through here. Uh, but I attributed the original to Confucius, when in fact it was really Mark Twain. <laughs> so I look back on my parents' history as immigrants to the US, pushed out by the communist revolution in China in the late 1940s, and the 30 years of statelessness they experienced until they were naturalized as US citizens in the late 1970s. My father benefited from the largesse of the Washington State University, which provided him a scholarship so he could earn a PhD in agricultural economics but then he needed to find a reliable way to support his family. He spent 15 years with the UN's Food and Agricultural Organization and then another 10 years with the Agricultural Development Council, which was then the sister to the Population Council, but is now called Winrock International. My mother, a horticulturalist by avocation and education, was constrained to nurture three children and my father. She and my father did their utmost to enrich the childhoods I and my two siblings enjoyed, first in East Pakistan, which is now Bangladesh, and then Thailand. I always felt whatever successes I had were as much a function of my mother's DNA, emotional and time investments as my father's. I asked my older son, who is a lawyer in DHHS, um, to introduce me, because I think it's clear that the US society grows by diversity, by acculturation, by generational talents, and by compassion. So I'll return to thanking them and the others um, at the end of my talk. One thing I got right about Mark Twain's saying is that failure is an orphan. But not in the sense that persons rush to claim credit for success and evade responsibility for failures. I interpret Twain's statement in a familiar ma manner. Parents are critical to child development, family environments, and it's subsequently to so societal welfare. Mothers, though, play an all critical role in gestational health, which has lifelong consequences. An orphan does not usually enjoy maternal nurturance. So through this talk, I hope to show you first how reproduction and the periconception period prepare, the, prepare maternal health for the pregnancy and fetal requirements that influence critical stages of development from birth to old age. And second, how contraception enables a healthy preconception period. That is, contraception acts as a social vaccine. Right, so before I start this journey with you, I want to say that I'm very glad the PAA awards precede the presidential address so that we have a bit of gender balance in the audience. I've often noticed this topic drives my male colleagues to their cell phones or out the door. <laughs> but because we're all the results of conditions of a uterine environment, and because it usually still takes a sperm and an egg to create a human, I'm hoping to capture the attention of those of you in the audience who have an XY chromosome as much as the XX one. Each of us, especially given the analytic talents of the PA members, is a successful product of a mother and a father. 
So I'm going to go through these four sections. And the takeaway messages are that um, healthy reproduction influence, influences early child development and adult well-being, and that poorly timed pregnancies can be prevented. That vaccines provide individual and group protection from infection. And the infection is, in this case, is a poorly timed pregnancy. And this enable, and these vaccines, in the case of contraception, can enable healthy birth spacing. That through processes of individual and social learning of contraceptive practice, we have achieved a level of herd immunity in most industrialized countries. And this enables other profound changes for families, societies, and population. So we'll start with reproductive biology and human development, touching on fetal growth, birth outcomes, and birth spacing. In 2011, this book called Origins was published in the popular literature, and the author, Annie pa uh, Murphy Paul, had read, the bar had read about David Barker's hypothesis, and then it inspired her to devote every chapter to a month of the pregnancy. And it reflected a growing interest in fetal development and health across the lifespan. Similarly, a series called First Years Last, Last Forever came out, and there is a huge, robust literature about early child development now. But in fact, 200 years before that, a philosopher and poet, Taylor Coleridge, had already expressed this, an interest in fetal development when he was observing the work of a colleague of his. And he said, the history of man for the nine months preceding his birth would probably be far more interesting and contain events of greater moment than all the three score and 10 years, which is 70 years, that follow it. So we'll go th through this reproductive health continuum, which begins with the blastocyst, the mass of cells that forms into the embryo and then into the fetus, which then is born as an infant and uh, becomes a child, becomes an adolescent and an adult. So this is one of those slides they tell you never to show at a big address because you can't read it, but you don't have to read it. I'm going to tell you what it says. So the important thing is the linkage between the maternal health in terms of her body composition and her diet and its influence in fetal growth. So when fetal undernutrition happens, uh, it can lead to a number of impairments in terms of organ development, which can then lead to other kinds of uh, chronic diseases such as high cholesterol, hypertension, and type 2 diabetes, and these all elevate the risk of coronary heart disease. Heart disease, sorry. The placenta is such an important organ here because it signals brain development of the child, it signals maternal nurturing so that the infant is not abandoned upon birth, and it signals time, the time for breastfeeding, the onset of breastfeeding. So in this nexus of the mother and the, through the placenta and through the child become the beginnings or those origins of adult health. And people don't necessarily accept all of this, but nonetheless, I think the, the evidence is growing that there are these linkages. So the fetal, fetal length, weight, and brain grow at different stages of the gestation and at different, um, at different rates. And you can see that length will grow first, peaking at around 20 weeks. Then the brain will, will appear in, around the 20, before the 20th week and then continue growing after birth well into childhood. And weight gain will peak just before birth, around 32 weeks, and then the birth will occur. So it's a, we may, many of you may remember when pregnancy risks were not really addressed in the 50s or 60s, and when women were allowed or even promoted, um, smoking was promoted, uh, and, and pregnant women were, in, were obviously targeted, uh, where there was fetal alcohol syndrome, which was also very uh, damaging to the fetal brain and then also ingesting certain kinds of medications like certain kinds of antibiotics during pregnancy and suffering different kinds of um, abnormal abnormalities at birth. But now things have changed, we're well aware of this. 
but these kinds of toxic um, sources of toxicity become important in terms of uh, impaired or adverse pregnancy outcomes. So the first trimester is a time of intensive growth of, of the vital organs and also the susceptibility of the fetus to harmful substances. So in the peri, peri, uh, preconception period before conception, infertility could be present, fetal loss, congenital anomalies may happen and not even be noticed. And this prog progresses through the periconception period and into the embryonic period. And then in the early fetal period, other deficiencies and the beginnings of preterm birth risks occur. And in the late fetal period, restricted intrauterine growth, uh, leading to even more um, ex uh, exacerbated birth, low birth weight. So about 15 million infants are born prematurely every year worldwide. These are largely preventable. And you can see that the rates for preterm birth are much higher in developing than in developed countries. So I draw this out not because of sort of the developing world syndrome, but largely because in the developing world, because it's, it's low income, the um, costs of poverty are much higher, as well as toxic exposures are much higher than in uh, developed countries. And to return to the, when the fetal, org, uh, fetal organs developing at different times, uh, the blue bars, rep, uh, the, really the yellow bars represent when different organs appear during gestation. Um, but the m most important thing is that the brain begins to develop at 20 weeks and continues after birth. So for cognitive performance, for early childhood, uh, development. We really want to do everything we can to have a healthy pregnancy and to protect the, the development of the brain. So, so for brain development, a um, large part of it begins with synapse density, the neural networks that start to form. And they form, obviously, when, when the infant is, is born, they are there. And they start to increase in density over time. And you can see by two years, there's a large, much more density at two years of the neural networks. And if you go into adulthood, you can see the density is also all similar. So the first two years of life are incredibly important for brain development. But in addition, there's a pruning that goes on to make brain functions more efficient. And that pruning you can see reflected in adulthood, and it does change over the life course. But if the pruning, I'm sorry, if the synapse density doesn't form adequately in childhood, then there is compromise later on. And synapse formation um, in the developing brain will depend on early life experiences. So you can see this curve of the sensory pathways for vision and hearing taking place early um, after birth, and then language development later on, and then higher cognitive functions later on. So all of these path, pathways and paces of development for the, for the brain make for important, have important implications for cognitive uh, functioning and performance later on in life. And this is um, to share evidence of uh, how measures of intellectual and motor functioning amongst a cohort of Nepalese, rural Nepalese uh, children at two years old, how they were different if their mother had received iron folic acid supplementation during the prenatal period compared to mothers who received other kinds of supplementation. So all of these differences are in a positive direction, that is, they indicate better intellectual and motor, and motor functioning with the supplementation. They are all statistically significant as well. And the next slide is a work by uh, Mark Hayward and his colleagues, Zhang, Zhang, Zhang Zemei and uh, Ganyang Gu. This shows um, that childhood deprivation in terms of nutrition had, it was associated with higher odds of, co of the onset of cognitive impairment amongst older Chinese men and women. And they used the China Health and Longitudinal Survey to, uh, uh, two ways to look at the onset of cognitive impairment in the two periods of time and whether or not it was associated with um, a nutrition measure of knee height from knee to ankle, as well as whether or not the 
uh, the older adults recalled when they were children that they frequently went to bed hungry. So we see associated odds here. Uh, less significant amongst men, not significant amongst men, and significant amongst women. This next slide here comes from a very recent study done by a, a colleague, uh, scientists at the International, uh, sorry, International Institute for Population Sciences who followed Indian children. And it looks at, again, different kind of in intelligence uh, scores. But the comparison here is between having an unintended pregnancy and an intended pregnancy. And again, we see the differences in favor of intended pregnancies. So overall, at the more macro level, because of improved nutrition, we can see that adult height has grown cons considerably, considerably by about eight inches here, comparing European countries with those in um, lower in the developing world. And so again, the access to nutrition and the ability to metabolize and, and have a healthier pregnancy is, it's very likely associated with uh, growing height. And this has been no observed by uh, a well-known economic historian, Robert Fogel, who used to be here at the University of Chicago, and studying how nutrition intake could have had an influence on economic productivity. So he says, the increase in the amount of calories available for work over the past 200 years must have made a significant contribution to the growth rate of per, of per capita income in countries such as France and Great Britain. And he goes on to show how chronic conditions have actually decreased in cohorts of adult males over time. And likewise, there is a literature that also, from, from the um, economics and neuro uh, developmental behavioral side, which suggests that these early, early investments um, are very important for subsequent productivity. So a growing literature shows that events in early life have long-term consequences for adult health, cognition, labor market success, both in developed and developing countries. And much of this is associated with the conditions of poverty or the absence of poverty and the presence of other kinds of toxic um, toxicities in the environment that can lead to impaired pregnancy outcomes. On the right side is a rate of return to human capital um, with the x-axis showing preschool, school, and post-school stages of the life course, and the curve itself is a rate of return to investments in these kinds of programs. So preschool programs have the highest rate of return in terms of the uh, quality of human capital. So Taking that information and trying to now segue to contraception, we have to think of the birth interval as, as the time in which contraception would take, would potentially have an effect. So we can see here uh, a sequence where there's a pregnancy, pregnancy one, there's pregnancy two. The time between it is the interpregnancy interval. Um, and some part of that is consumed with uh, lactation some part of that with not full lactation and some part of that where the woman is not pregnant and not lactating. Because these periods have implications for her, her, her dietary intake and the energy stores that she has. And during the period where she's fully lactating and she has just come out of the delivery where already the transfer of, of energy has been in the favor of the infant and now she's lactating, if she is not in perfect, perfect health, she could enter in this period of maternal depletion. But if she, is, if she receives adequate diet, if her physical activity is also helpful and there's an absence of illness, then she can have a period of maternal repletion where the stores uh, return and where she can be ready for the next pregnancy. And again, use of nutrient supplements is important there. But this period of maternal repletion can be prolonged with contraception. So that can lengthen the birth interval and ensure that she herself returns to health before the next pregnancy. And again, more evidence showing that optimal birth intervals are associated with much less 
uh, adverse birth outcomes and mortality than very short birth intervals. So very short birth intervals, which are defined as from birth to birth being less than 18 months uh, compared to the optimal birth intervals of 36 to 59 months. You can see here these data which are which come from uh, reanalysis of five cohort um, studies looking at whether or not the inner birth interval, if it was too short, what was the what was the elevated risk for being small for gestational age, which is low birth weight, or preterm, or any of these other outcomes. And the highest risk is if you are born preterm as well as small for gestational age. But mortality outcomes are also uh, elevated, although neonatal mortality is not statistically significant. Right, so turning to the next section on immunology, I'm going to do the primer on immunology. I talk about adaptive community, vaccine properties, and herd immunity. So the two types of immunity, one is innate immunity. We all have it. This is present at birth. It's not specific. It's not directed towards any particular antigen. Um, and some site examples are skin and mucosal membranes. So if you get a, a inflammation, you have an inflammatory response uh, through your skin or your mucosal uh, membrane. The other type of immunity is adaptive immunity, and adaptive immunity is where is relevant to vaccine development. So it's acquired through lifetime. It precisely recognizes and remembers a particular type of antigen or invading microbe. And an example of it is your lymphatic system, which will respond to partic particular kinds of um, insults, uh, antigen insults. And through the active immunity, plasma cells will produce antibodies. And these antibodies are bind to the antigens and become what's important in terms of developing a vaccine. And in the process of being exposed to the antigen, there can be a primary response and a secondary response. So the primary response is to the initial exposure, but if there's a, sec if there's a subsequent exposure, then the secondary response generates more antibodies. And that immunologic memory in your, in your, um, in the vac is what is used for the vaccine. So to take you through the pathways, the antigen presents by the dendritic cell, it activates a T cell. There are memory T cells and helper T cells that are generated. Me uh, memory T cells are important because you want to build immunologic memory against the antigen. Helper T cells, in turn, can generate a cytotoxic T cell, which will target the antigen on its own. But it can also activate B cells, which produce more memory uh, and they produce these memory B cells and plasma cells, which produce the antibody. So the desirable features of a vaccine include that it should confer a high level of immunological memory, and that's through the production of the memory and T, uh, T and B cells. And it should recognize the same antigen on the pathogen and initiate an immune response right away. It should not produce side of serious side effects, and it, you can develop different kinds of vaccines to address the same antigen. So we know that most childhood vaccines are very effective. Their efficacy levels range between 90 and 100%, and you would want this. You would not want to have vaccine failure, which occurs when individuals fail to establish a high enough level of immunologic memory. But our aim is to ensure that what is good about vaccines is uh, distributed uh, or, or spread, disseminated through a, a population, a community, so that you can achieve this level of herd immunity. So what is herd immunity? So herd immunity happens when a certain proportion of the population is immunized and confers this protection to the rest of the members in the population. So on the left, you can see a situation of no herd immunity, where the yellow circle represents an infected um, individual who interacts with a gray circle who is a non-vaccinated individual who interacts with, a, with blue circles, um, and these are vaccinated individuals. And there's no herd immunity because the, and there's not a high enough percent of this population that's vaccinated. So the 
disease will transmit forward. On the right side is herd immunity, and you see that the uh, yellow arrows, which indicate the infection transmission, does not progress very far because there is a higher percentage of individuals in that population who are vaccinated. So for those who are social scientists, you should probably recognize that social networks can help establish herd immunity in terms of interactions and who as a node in the network or connectors are immunized, so to speak, and then they can provide herd immunity. So we'll come back to that in a bit. So now I'd like to address unplanned pregnancy and contraceptive protection, talking about its mechanisms, coverage of contraception, and the benefits. So most of you know that there are different ways in which contraceptive methods work. Uh, first is by preventing ovulation, for example, the pill, or preventing the sperm from reaching the egg. Uh, typical method here would be the condom. Preventing fertilization, for example, withdrawal is a, is, a mode, is a means for preventing fertilization, as is rhythm. Uh, preventing implantation, uh, the intrauterine device, uh, and, preventing, and providing postpartum contraception, such as lactational amenorrhea during breastfeeding. And there have been a number of different um, contraceptive me methods developed over the past 50 some years, beginning with the pill, IUD, followed by non-scalpel vasectomy, uh, the copper T IUD, and you can see between 1990 and 2010, many more forms of contraception or modifications of existing methods were developed, including the vaginal ring, implants, and emergency contraception, and the female condom. And there's a wide range of of contraceptive methods in use worldwide. 30% uh, of all users around the world rely on female sterilization, 21% on the IUD, 14% on the pill, and 12% on male condoms. And you can see that the what we call traditional methods, rhythm and withdrawal, account for a total of 10%. So the number of contraception, contraceptive options that are out there is important as well for providing cho choice. And contraceptive use by reproductive age women who are in union has increased substantially since the 1960s. So we can start with the developing world where only about 14% in 1960 were measured to be using contraception. By 2015, this number is, uh, has increased four fourfold and even in places like East Asia, where it reaches almost four out of every five women in this category using contraception, or three out of four in Latin America. So there's extremely high coverage of contraception in many of these regions. And certainly in the world, it has increased from 36 to 64%. The only region now that is lagging uh, behind is Sub-Saharan Africa, but it too is changing. And we can see also that birth intervals are increasing, and consequently, we would expect infant mortality rates to decline. But birth intervals have uh, increased from a median length of 31 months to 36 months now after 2000. And in the United States, with using the last NSFG result, we see the median birth interval at 38 months, so not far away. So what are the benefits of contraception? I shouldn't have to tell this audience this. Um, I will draw your attention to this book cover here called The Birth of the Pill. Uh, this shows a woman probably in the 1960s looking at her hairdo and the artwork. But this is a book about four crusaders who launched, uh, who reinvented sex and launched a revolution. And they were Catherine McCormick, uh, Gregory Pincus, John Rock, and Margaret Sanger. So this book is about the, the story of how they worked as a team to bring the pill um, into public access. But the first benefit would be increase in coital frequency and sexual satisfaction, because the important thing would be to be able to separate sex from conception risk. A second important benefit is to prevent poor maternal health and maternal mortality, and a third is 
sorry, preventing infant mortality and other adverse child outcomes. So we'll take the first one. And my colleagues at, at Hopkins, Suzanne Bell and David Bashai, recently published this article in Studies in Family Planning. But they looked at 55 um, countries with demographic and health surveys and looked at the relationship between reporting sex in the last four weeks by whether or not you were contracepting to space or to limit, as compared to women who were not contracepting but wanted to delay a birth. And the odds are three times higher of reporting sex in the last four weeks if you were, if you were contracepting. These are adjusted odds ratios and statistically significant. And the Demographic and Health Survey, as well as the NSFG, have calendars by which we can try to look at the actual, me actually measure the duration of contraceptive use in that all important birth interval. Does contraception delay the next birth? Does it prolong, prolong the length of that birth interval such that you can have more optimal birth spacing? So this is work I've been doing with Andrea Krianga and Ching Feng Li, taking 28 demograph uh, calendars from the demographic and health surveys and measuring how much of that interval is actually reported to be covered by contraceptive use, by breastfeeding, or by a combination of the two, and how much of it is not covered. So using that calendar on the left side, you can see that there is, these are forest plots, so the countries are the rows, you can see that red line drops down way away from the line that is zero. So that indicates a highly significant result. And on the right side, the same thing, but, the, delay, but to the prevention of a child death before age six. And again, it is statistically significant. So we took these hazard, this is a multivariate hazard model, so we took the hazard ratios and simulated what if the woman used contraception for 24 months, what would be the reduction in risk? And so the reduction in pregnancy risk was 81%, so over, a two, over the uh, period. And then for child death, it was 38%. So there should be better ways of trying to estimate the effect of contraception, but we haven't really done the due diligence on this. Right, so contraception now is a social vaccine, and here we talk about social processes and human capital improvements. So I'm taking you back to the pathways by which um, uh, immunity happens, is acquired. So in an individual, the antigen here is a poorly timed pregnancy, and the activation can be the child may die, uh, the woman may seek a termination, but she will respond, or he will respond. Then the memory T cells are generated by this. So now the individual has learned and begins to use contraception. But there are also helper T cells where the individual learns but helps others to learn also about using contraception. Again, from that helper T cell action, there can be cytotoxic T cells or people or specialists who actively, who arise to actively educate and provide contraception to others. So you could think of the cytotoxic T cell as somebody who's targeting this antigen as being like a leader. And it could be a Margaret Sanger, or today it could be Melinda Gates. B cell activation means additional individuals are affected by the unintended pregnancy. Remember, we're building the immunologic memory here. And then we have other people who now learn and go on to use contraception, as well as other activists who emerge to help others access contraception. And they are the plasma cells, and they then enable individuals to contracept, who are the antibodies, against the infection of a poorly timed pregnancy. But we can also look at this, and we should look at this as a social process. So this is the same thing, but in terms of sociological change. We have unintended pregnancy rates as the antigen and the social response by affected individuals. Again, the first memories T cells being produced, this is collective learning and behavioral change with 
again, helper T cells, which can be the ideational change and social influence that goes on. And the cytotoxic C T cells, again, produce more um, social leaders who will respond to the problems. And then there will be a B cell activation, which could be like expanded group learning, social diffusion, contagion processes. And in turn, the memory that you want to build up in the system is generational memory and norming of contraceptive practice. And then plasma cells can be thought of as the social connections, the networks, the institutions that assure contraceptive access. And they, in turn, produce these antibodies. And I'm referring here to a term used, uh, coined by Larry Bumpus and Charlie Westhoff in 1970 in a science article, which we've already forgotten, called The Perfect Contraceptive Society, wherein people are able to manage the timing and number of their pregnancies. And this generational memory has been uh, discussed by many people in terms of the norming, the acceptability of contraception, and um, even Robert Putnam, has, who is a uh, well-known author, has said that what we are trying to do is, is separate or reduce and reshift the burden of childbearing to becoming more of a choice, to having it by choice. So I hope I've made the case that we can think of contraception as social vaccine. It has high efficacy against unplanned pregnancies for different periods of vulnerability in an individual's life, uh, life course, but including lifetime if it's a permanent method, that ha has minimal side effects, most uh, contraceptive methods have minimal side effects, and that social diffusion has, has established herd immunity. But this is not a one-time process. There is a recurring need, just in the case, as in the case of child vaccines, to in, to immunize each emerging birth cohort, and similarly in the case of contraception, contraception as a social vaccine, the need to continually re-educate and teach. And in the United States, we actually have what I think is herd immunity. On the left from NSFG, you can see that if a woman is sexually experienced and has used family planning, she's part of 99% of American women. And on the right, we see trends in the percent of sexually experienced teens using condoms at first sex. Beginning in 2002, we're already at 66% for women and 70% for teen, teen females. Uh, sorry, the orange are the males. So it was at 70% for teen males. And this has grown to where in 2011 and 13, counterpart figures are roughly 70% and 75%. So think about this, those of us who were growing up in the 70s, um, where the idea of having a teen birth was t completely stigmatized and frowned upon, we are now looking at teens who are able to report that at first sex, 75% or more of them are actually using a condom. And I consider that to be a reflection of herd immunity. And the CDC has recognized, so this is an example of the um, cytotoxic T cell or the, or the plasma cells. The, the CDC has recognized family planning as one of the top 10 public health achievements of the 20th century. Again, something we don't necessarily remember when we need it. So to review, Go to the next one. To review, for each of these, maternal well-being, the first message is maternal well-being is critical for fetal and, child, and early child development, that contraceptives have vaccine-like properties, that contraceptives protect in the preconception period, and that social diffusion creates herd immunity against the out negative outcomes of poorly timed pregnancies. And I'm not making this up. Uh, this is actually from the Atlantic uh, of uh, August 2016. The author's name is Derek Thompson. And he talks about the pill, the condom, and the American dream. And he actually argues that 
the narrowing of the achievement gap between poor and rich kids is, has happened where that reading and math skill preparedness has grown considerably amongst low-income children, even and the teen birth rate was had dropped by 50% in the same period of time. And he thinks that contraception could be the cause, and not just the pill and the condom, but also the, of late, the intrauterine device. So he argues that the adoption of contraception, particularly contraception that has low user failure rates, has enabled parents to spend more time, interact with their children, and that that has helped improve, uh, that has helped improve the, um, uh, or narrow the achievement gap. So where do we go from here? I would like to suggest that we continue, we need con to continue the development of new methods, which then requires federal uh, research support. We should look at failure in contraceptive practice because it should be nearly 100% effective. And we can try to isolate more the role of contraception and its linkages to early child development. Th that won't be easy, but nonetheless, I think we have the data. And it would be also really um, wonderful if we could spend more of our effort looking at contraception and how economic inequality and social mobility changes as a result of use. So thank you very much. And Thank you. And I do want to acknowledge and thank all these institutions that have been so important in my own career. Uh, Forty years ago, my husband and I graduated from the University of Chicago this very year. We married there. We met there. We married there. We had our two children there. Chicago has been great for us, but so have many other institutions and colleagues. And I thank you for listening to this talk, and I thank my family. Thank you. totally forgot that, memory slips, that you're invited to the cocktail hour after this, and it will be in this room. So please, thank you very much again.